four months ago, I wasn't a Destiny player at all. I had never played Destiny 1, and I only played Destiny 2's main campaign when it first came out on PC. Honestly, back then, the game was alright, I guess. It was fine. But I just didn't think too much of it, and I moved on after beating the storyline. Now, the reason that I decided to try out Destiny 2 again is a combination of a couple of things, actually. First up, which is completely unrelated to Destiny itself, was because the game that I was currently very much into, uh, The Division 2, wasn't really doing it for me. The views on my channel were still good. It's still the best month that I ever had, hands down. Uh, but I just wasn't having as much fun with it anymore, so I wanted to find a new game to main. I tried a couple of things, nothing really stuck for various reasons, until the Activision and Bungie split was announced and Destiny came back into the spotlight for me. Uh, a bit later, as a result of the split, Bungie started talking about how they wanted Destiny 2 to become this ever-evolving game to be supported for many years to come. Uh, and that is something that I find extremely appealing, no matter what game we're talking about. I think the reason that I like this so much is because I like to really get invested into games. But if I know I'm playing a game that will not be supported properly anymore in just a few months time, then something tells me that I'm just wasting my time. Even though I'm having fun with the game, it still feels as if I'm sort of wasting my time a bit. And when I first played Destiny 2 again, I started with uh, the Forsaken campaign, the whole thing on a Tangled Shore. Uh, it took a couple days and then when I was done with that, I did some quick Crucible as well. Uh, because everybody told me to try out the PvP as well. Uh, and even though the game felt very good to play, it's nice to move around and it feels good to shoot your weapons in Destiny, everybody pretty much knows that, I really wasn't blown away by the whole experience. And this was for a big part because the Forsaken storyline, uh, the whole thing on the Tangled Shore, it felt that it was filled with a lot of missions that was just side content or filler. Uh, yeah, you get to visit some cool places and you get to, uh, you know, mess around with some different weapons and stuff, but a lot of the Forsaken campaign was also doing daily bounties, I guess. Go to this place, kill that guy, uh, go to this place, do that, and it didn't really feel special to me. It didn't wow me. Apart from some of the final bosses that you had to kill during the strikes or the missions, uh, I still remember being very afraid and almost unable to kill the Warden's Servitor boss when doing the Nightfall. I mean, depending on how fast this boss is, we can do it in 15 minutes. I just gotta get my ult quickly, and then we can actually do it. Oh, what is the... I don't know what's going on. I'm dead. Okay, alright, alright. Um, yeah. He got angry. Of course, now I know that you can just delete the guy uh, with some good weapons. But yeah, apart from some cool bosses, I didn't really feel that the game offered me many new things that I couldn't find in other games. I even said in my Destiny 2 video that I made at the time that I probably wouldn't be playing Destiny 2 that much in the future. And yet, here we are, four months later, and Destiny 2 is pretty much my main game. It's pretty much the only game that I play right now. I mean, I even got World's 26th place with some friends during the most recent World First race, which is of course very far away from the first place. I'm not trying to brag here like, hey, look how good we are. Because we're not really too good at the game, it's just I'm saying this is how invested we are in the game. This is how much we're playing because, yeah, it does take quite some time uh, to prepare for a world's first race. Uh, you, of course, have to get to the right light level. And then in my case, I also had to collect a whole bunch of good exotics and pinnacle weapons uh, on top of that. So, yeah, the short story is, is that I really like this game right now. And in this video, I wanted to talk to you about how I went from... Yeah, I guess this game is kind of okay. It's not bad, but it's, I don't know, it's not really amazing either. To where I'm at right now, where, yeah, I'm, I'm playing only Destiny 2, pretty much. Uh, with two goals in mind. First up, I just want to share my story, let you know uh, what, what went through my mind at every step of the way, I guess. And then I also wanted to give you some insight on what Destiny 2 is and what Destiny 2 isn't for the people that are maybe thinking of trying it out as well. Because yeah, the game is free right now and you can try it out for free if you want to do that. But I also know that if you are anything like me, making it free still doesn't make you try the game out instantly because you don't know what the game's gonna be like in the long run at the end game and you don't feel like investing all that time up front to find out. At least that's what prevents me from trying out a lot more games. I just feel like yeah, maybe it's not going to be the, the game for me in the long run, so I end up not trying it at all. So yeah, that's what this video is pretty much going to be. I'm not going to hold you up too much longer. Let's start by talking about the core gameplay. Um, 
everything from the shooting to the movement to all that stuff. So yeah, when I started the Forsaken storyline four months ago, one of the first weapons that I got was a bow. Uh, wasn't actually one of the first weapons, but it was uh, a little bit earlier in the storyline that I got a bow. And the first thing that I noticed with it is how forgiving the aim was on that weapon. Uh, with the bow, I could aim for the head and then I could move a little bit to the left or the right or above. I could miss the head by quite a big amount and the arrow would still connect. Now, I don't have to tell the experienced Destiny players what's going on here, but for everybody else, this is something that the game has that is called bullet magnetism. And almost every weapon in the game has this feature. What it does is that it basically curves your bullets, or in this case arrows, towards opponents if you shoot near them. So what could have been a miss without the bullet magnetism can oftentimes still count as a hit in Destiny 2. Now depending on where you're coming from, seeing something like this is either a blessing or a curse. It is of course very easy to say, Destiny 2 is a game for players who can't use mouse and keyboards. And while yeah, I gotta admit that on some of these weapons, the bullet magnetism is uh, just, just a little bit too strong. I'm looking at you, LMG. I'd still say that play the game first and then see what you think of it, because here's the thing. I didn't know that bullet magnetism was a thing until I got that bow. It was the most obvious with the bow. It is true that almost all of the weapons have this sort of bullet magnetism, but most weapons have it to a far lesser degree, and only within certain ranges. Uh, long range primary weapons are most certainly the biggest offenders of having the most bullet magnetism, uh, such as bows, scout rifles and pulse rifles, which is also funnily enough why a lot of players uh, in this game are calling pulse rifles dad rifles after the gamer dads who need an extra hand with things. And honestly, after playing Destiny for a while, I can see why some of these weapons uh, have this sort of stuff, why it makes sense on some of the weapons to have a little bit of extra aim assist or a little bit of extra bullet magnetism. The bow, for example, can be quite tricky to land consistent headshots with if you didn't have this on faster moving enemies in PvE. Uh, and in a game that is so focused on the amount of damage that you do, because it is also an RPG besides being an FPS, uh, without the bullet magnetism, nobody would ever go for a bow over a weapon that is far easier to use, such as an automatic gun. So with the automatic gun having less bullet magnetism and with the bow having more, that sort of evens the weapons out, makes them equally strong, I guess. And even now, almost nobody uses a bow in PvE anyway. So it's not like that the more bullet magnetism you have, the stronger a gun is going to be. Now don't get me wrong, I do think that this feature is there because Destiny was originally a console-only title. And with the movement in this game being just as important as the actual shooting, Bungie probably figured that moving fast while aiming accurately on the controller, and then also using a bow at the same time, it just doesn't really work. So if they wanted to make this work, they needed to do something with bullet magnetism. And when moving the game over to PC, uh, this feature stayed in. And, well, uh, you can think of it what you will. I don't mind it. Let's just put it like that. And yes, movement in Destiny 2 is just as important as shooting to the experience. Uh, it may not be as obvious when you first start playing, but it will be after you play for a little bit. In many ways, Destiny 2 reminds me a lot of those older 3D platformer games that I used to play on the PlayStation 2. Uh, Ratchet and Clank, uh, the, that franchise is a good example, or maybe Rayman, uh, which both of those games let you travel to crazy environments or from planet to planet to there find some enemies with crazy weapons and jump from rock to rock. Sounds like a pretty familiar experience, right? I can even compare the final boss from Rayman 3, uh, which is this boss where you have to like uh, circle around the boss and jump on platforms and then go and hit the weak spot on his back to kill him. Uh, I can even compare that boss to the final boss in one of the raids where it's literally the same thing where you have a lot of these platforms around the boss that you have to jump on and then hit his weak points to do damage to him. Almost makes me wonder if uh, Bungie uh, took some uh, inspiration from some of these games. Every mission that you play, every activity that you do, it is filled with platforms and cliffs that you can climb on and also jump off or fall into. It's not always lethal, uh, but it does give you a lot of freedom of where you want to go. And it just feels good to play. And even the raids oftentimes have dedicated jumping parts where the only goal is uh, to make it to the other side of the room or to the other side of the encounter without falling to your death. 
uh, some of the best secret missions in the game, uh, such as Whisper of the Worm or Zero Hour, are mostly jumping puzzles as well, up until you get all the way to the end where you then have to kill a couple of vets and a couple of bosses. But just like the gunplay, uh, the movement in Destiny 2 is also very forgiving. Of course, you have different type of jumps depending on what class you play, but Hunters, for example, have a triple jump, which allows them to jump again mid-air twice. And Titans have a jetpack, which makes it very easy to redirect where you want to land mid-air. And that makes not falling to your death most of the time very easy, I guess. On top of that, your character also has uh, this uh, clamber ability. He can grab onto walls or ledges that you otherwise would not have been able to get on top of. Which also helps out a lot and most of the time can save you from uh, falling to your death if you made a mistake. You didn't grab. That's bullshit, Marco. Most of the time. And yeah, I think that movement can easily make or break a game. If it feels clunky and choppy and not responsive, that alone can be a reason that I simply don't want to play a game. And to be fair, I'd play Destiny 2 just to do the jumping puzzles with some friends every now and then, because regardless of what you think about the other stuff in the game, about the game as a whole, the movement I don't think could have been much better. Uh, apart from the weird physics system sometimes. So now let's talk a little bit about the game itself. What is there to do? How's the main story? Uh, what activities can I do? How's the loot? All that stuff. So yeah, uh, I'm gonna be honest and say that I wasn't and I'm still not the biggest fan of the story arcs in this game. Whether it was the Red War campaign or the Forsaken DLC or even the recently released Moon DLC storyline. The Red War, for example, I thought the story itself was pretty cheesy with a super over-the-top bad guy must kill and destroy everything and a typical cliche of uh, you being the hero who has to save everything it's all up to you uh, and although some of the set pieces and, and places that you visit in this game are just looking fantastic uh, the game during the story is an absolute cakewalk and the final boss especially the final boss in the red war campaign was an even bigger joke super 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 easy to kill with almost no mechanics to it uh, Forsaken had a much better boss that was more difficult to kill or maybe I just wasn't as well equipped at the end of the campaign as I was for the Red War. But the campaign itself, yeah again it had some cool missions, some really cool places to visit, but I also felt that it was filled to the teeth with busy work. I already said this earlier in this video like killing X amount of enemies here and then going to Y location and then killing a guy there uh, and basically doing daily bounties for the spider which is Destiny's version of Jabba the Hutt from Star Wars, I guess. I, I just didn't feel like it was an experience that was very unique or, or very creative, uh, apart from the locations that you visit. And honestly, the Moon DLC felt pretty much the same. Now, I heard a lot of veteran players say that the Moon storyline was far better than the previous ones in terms of actual storytelling, but I wouldn't really know that because I haven't really been following the story too much. Uh, but in terms of actual missions and the stuff that you do, the gameplay side of it, I think that the moon had even less content than Forsaken did, and yet somehow had more busy work with it, again, doing bounties and whatnot, you know, killing 100 enemies here, killing 100 enemies there. That's the main storyline of the moon, uh, actually. Now, I'm not gonna sit here and say that the moon and the Tangled Shore didn't have uh, cool places or some cool missions in there, uh, some, some of these things look amazing and I really liked, for example, going into the big ship uh, during the Moon DLC. Whatever it was, I still don't really know the whole story behind it. Uh, but yeah, doing bounties and filler content to get there. I don't know, man. It just didn't really sit right with me. It wasn't too great of an experience. And then once I finally got to visit the ship again and, and went inside, uh, the Shadow Keep story was pretty much already over. And it only took like four hours, I felt it was light on content, if anything. I honestly think that the best piece of Shadowkeep content, the raid aside of course, just released yesterday. Uh, it was the dungeon, a mission with some actual mechanics that isn't too hard but still leaves you with some stuff to figure out. And since yesterday we also have a lot more reason to actually visit the moon now with a new blind well type of activity and with another exotic quest that actually pushes you to do the lost sectors. Uh, because that's just another gripe that I really had with the moon. Uh, besides 
after you beat the campaign for XP farming and for maybe the Deadbringer exotic quest, there wasn't really a reason to ever visit the moon. And now I'm pretty sure that after we're done with this LMG quest, there's not really ever a reason to go back to all these lost sectors and all these areas that the developers clearly put a lot of work into. And I think that's a bit of a shame, because where Destiny shines, in my opinion, is when it pushes you into these areas through, for example, exotic quests, like most recently with Moon, uh, the Deadbringer rocket launcher. Of course, I don't even have to mention Whisper of the Worm or Outbreak Perfected. Uh, I am never going to forget Zero Hour. I'm never going to forget Whisper of the Worm. But I honestly don't even remember what the campaign missions on the moon were and what was just part of free roam and side quests. I, I remember the first mission, I guess, and the last mission, I guess, but everything in between. I don't really know if that was main missions or just some open world activities. And I know that's not a fair comparison to compare Zero Hour with the main campaign of the Moon DLC because Zero Hour probably wasn't part of the main campaign of another DLC either. And I know the Moon also came out with this dungeon that was also a very memorable experience. I'm just saying, hey, this is the stuff I really like about Destiny 2 and this is the stuff that I don't dislike per se but also isn't something that gets me all too excited. So what is it that got me so much into Destiny 2 then? Because so far it doesn't sound like a bad game but it also doesn't sound like a game that will blow you out of the water. And yeah, you'd be right, because so far I haven't really talked about what the turning point for me was that led me to like Destiny 2 so much. So let's talk about that now. Let's talk about raids. I think it's pretty safe to say that the rating in Destiny is like no other game out there. Yeah, there are other games with raids, uh, World of Warcraft for example, everybody knows that. Uh, it has raids that require far more players than Destiny does. And then there's Final Fantasy XIV, and even The Division 2 has had its first raid release recently. But name another first-person shooter with the type of movement that we talked about earlier that lets you play raids as well. Could be that I'm not aware of those games. I don't know every game out there, but I don't think there really is. Now, of course, just because Destiny offers a unique experience, something that no other game does, doesn't instantly mean that the experience will be good. But I've played through and beaten all the raids now, and it has always been a very fun and satisfying experience. The first raid I played was Scorch of the Past, which was actually a raid that didn't blow me out of the water. Uh, if I had to rank it right now, it would probably be almost all the way on the bottom. Uh, it had some nice mechanics, it had some unique things like a sparrow racing section, but at the end of the day, it just still kind of felt like a really difficult mission for six players and nothing more. It didn't really feel like a crazy adventure but I had fun regardless so I kind of kept going with raids and the week after that was the week that we played Last Wish and we went into that blind with two members of Redeem which you might have heard of Glenn and Femi who they wouldn't actually help out they would just sit there and enjoy the experience of our suffering because they already knew it was gonna be a mess I think it took us about 12 hours to beat this raid blind uh, you can still see the whole VOD on my Twitch and this experience alone really changed a lot of how I felt about Destiny 2. Because the game is fairly easy overall. I'd say that Destiny 2 is a pretty casual, friendly experience. It's not too hard of a game, especially not if you're just doing the main story or grinding some stuff. But then Last Wish just throws all of that out of the window and gives you a brutally difficult experience, while at the same time presenting you with some of the best visuals I've seen in any game ever. Unlike Scorch of the Past, which took place on Earth and sort of had this destroyed Earth environment to it, which I've already seen in so many other games and honestly I've seen done better than in Destiny. So, you know, it wasn't really that interesting. Unlike Scorch of the Past, Last Wish takes place in the Dreaming City, which we just talked about earlier, which is this very good looking environment uh, and everything from the setting to the story, to the encounters, it was just all so well put together. Now I'm not gonna spoil any raid mechanics in this video for any potential viewers that haven't gotten around to doing any of the raids yet and are also planning to do these raids blind, which I highly recommend doing by the way. Let me give you some advice, there's plenty of time to farm and speedrun these raids afterwards if that's something that you want to do. But you can only get the blind experience once and it is by far the most fun thing about these raids. So don't spoil the mechanics for yourself. 
do yourself a favor. But yeah, the raid was just really well put together. You start off with the story that you have to kill a big dragon, which, you know, like, you're kind of thinking, what's this? Uh, and then you go through multiple mysterious rooms, you fight multiple bosses, you cross this giant bridge that sits in the middle of the Dreaming City that you can actually see from outside of the raid. There's a fair amount of jumping that you have to do, and when you get close to the end, you have, hands down, the most difficult puzzle I have ever seen in a video game that was mandatory to do to complete a core activity. I'm not counting super obscure easter eggs because of course there's a lot of games out there that have really really difficult puzzles but they're optional, they're sort of secrets, they're not part of something like a raid. Aside from those things, I think the vault is the most difficult encounter I've ever seen in, uh, in a video game to, to figure out how to beat it. It's a very difficult puzzle and it's also very satisfying if you figure out how it works by yourself. Uh, and then once you get past that, you get to this big epic boss fight that is extremely difficult as well. And yes, guys, you don't have to tell me that you can cheese it. Uh, I know you can cheese it. I know all those things now, but I simply don't recommend players doing that when going through the raid uh, for the very first time, because that's not as much fun. Uh, of course you can cheese it. Of course you can do it for the loot, but I wouldn't wouldn't say you want to do that right away right and yeah once you finally kill the boss you think the raid's over you think you beat it surprise the music kicks in and there's this last super high intensity part which is just it's just great it just all comes together so well i just really really enjoyed last wish and then there are also raids in a game like leviathan which takes place on a giant golden spaceship the size of a planet i'm pretty sure which can be beaten in a non-linear way because there are all kinds of buttons around every encounter that leads to secret passages around the ship uh, and this size the, the area of this size the amount of square meters that the developers put on this ship i'm pretty sure the area is bigger than some of the some of the planets in destiny 2 it's honestly incredibly big now not every raid is that good uh, but every raid is at least an enjoyable experience Spire, Eater, and the most recent Garden of Salvation are all very in difficulty, but they're all really good raids as well. And yes, they're not as good as Last Wish, but there are all reasons alone that I at least play Destiny 2 on the side at a minimum. Here's the thing though, I am aware that this isn't going to be a reason for everybody to play this game, because for a lot of you out there, you might not have five friends to play the raids with, let alone five friends that also haven't done any of the raids themselves for the true blind runs, uh, and also not everybody is going to have Glad and Femi from Redeem join up to mess around with you during the raids for the extra comedic relief. Uh, you know, I definitely got a YouTuber treatment right there and I, I recognize that this is not going to be the experience that everybody can get. And I'm also fully aware that the, the looking for game discords aren't really the best place to search for players to do raids with blind either because Everybody who's in the looking for groups discord server usually wants the raids to be done within 20 to 30 minutes and expects everybody to at least know what they're doing. Uh, you can already see the post yourself, you know, looking for game last wish raid, must have collected every exotic, must have at least soloed it flawless once, must drive a BMW as personal vehicle, must have at least a D cup or a 12 inch dick. Also, a mic would be nice, but it's not a requirement. I recognize that the looking for game discord can be uh, a little bit difficult if you're if you're trying to do the, the raids blind. So let's talk about the end game that Destiny 2 has to offer that isn't about the raids then. Is this game any good in the long run if you cannot play raids? Well, that kind of depends on who you are. But honestly, without the raids, Destiny 2 doesn't really have a whole bunch of things that stand out as much. What the endgame loop will look like for you is probably getting to max light level, which is max power level for those players who don't play Destiny. Uh, and that means that you're probably only going to be playing uh, a handful of activities, because only a handful of activities give you that powerful gear. You gotta play 8 PvP matches a week, that's one powerful drop. You gotta play 3 Gambit games, that's another powerful drop. You gotta complete 3 strikes, uh, you complete... 8 strike bounties, yeah you complete a whole bunch of bounties that you get from the tower basically. That's probably 80% of what your experience will be like. Uh, and sure you can also get some powerful drops from Prime Engrams, which is just loot that drops on the floor pretty much. That uh, you can get while doing any activity. But 
a lot of the time, if you want to be at least a little bit efficient, you end up doing sort of the same thing every week, neglecting all other activities in the game. Meaning that over half of all the content that's in the game, you never really get to do. It's, it's actually an honest question that I have. Is anybody still going to the moon, as in to the place itself, to the lost sectors? Is there a reason to go there? I, I really don't know. Uh, and this is not just something that I'd ask for the moon, but also for all the other places. Like, for example, the Dreaming City, which is this beautiful, beautiful environment. Uh, with, I think there's stuff to do there, but I've never really been there yet because I don't really feel like there is a reason to do it. Um, the only places I know in the Dreaming City are the Blind Well, which is straight down the middle from where you spawn and then you have this one place where you can pick up a chest as well uh, but even those chests i don't really do anymore because they stopped giving powerfuls other than these places i have never seen anything else of the dreaming city of course besides the raid and the strike that you play from the playlist i mean who still does planetary bounties or those quests in the dreaming city why would you even go there who is doing spider bounties, forges, who is still doing public events or lost sectors or heroic adventures outside of uh, just the Flashpoint weekly. There's a lot of content in the game that you never even have to look at. Um, and the only thing you basically end up doing is playlist stuff. Strikes, Gambit, Crucible, uh, the Nightmare Hunts and then some Vex Offensive I guess. And then you want to get some bounties from the tower. That's all that you have to do in Destiny to gear up, and that's all that you can do to gear up in Destiny 2. Uh, a good amount of the beautiful open world that they've built with all the secrets and all the extra things in every nook and cranny, with all the activities everywhere, you never get to do that as a new player right now. You don't really get to interact with any of that um, when you're at the end game. And that's, again, that's a shame because in many ways uh, that open world and interacting with all those little things and finding those secrets uh, that's what I think is one of the best things about Destiny 2. I remember an interview all the way back from 2013 with Ryan Bernard, the game's director for The Division 1, which had not released yet at that time. And in that interview he said that uh, in The Division, in the open world, you will never see other players that aren't part of your squad because players are not looking for that kind of thing in games anymore. I've been in the industry quite a while now. I've been playing online games since around, you know, I don't even want to say, but let's say back with EverQuest 99. And I think back then it was amazing to see people, you know, when you were just running around doing something and oh my God, that's another player and and wow. And I think that the the, the thrill of that has more than worn off for uh, for players. And now it's generally more of an annoyance when someone is there that uh, isn't one of your friends or part of your group uh, in an area where you're trying to, you know, do content, do missions, do, you know, whatever. As a result, the Division 1 did not have any instances where you could see players in the open world to interact with that weren't part of your squad. And coming to Destiny 2 and seeing all these random players pop up everywhere, come together for public events, for the blind well, it's just... It's just nice to see. It's just a cool extra addition. I have met so many players that I simply saw and that I messed around with a little bit. I don't know, taking selfies <laughs> at some stupid place for a screenshot or, you know, just shooting at each other or just teabagging a bit or just doing random emotes. Uh, those kind of things are just fun. It makes the game feel more alive. And when you're doing activities in Destiny 2, when you're on one of these planets doing some exotic quest, when you're exploring some area for a Werner chest, or when you're doing some easter egg, or when you're doing some mission, uh, and when you see all these players everywhere, this is where the game truly feels like somewhat of an MMO, with a world that has many more players in it. And when you get to the end game, and all of the stuff that you're gonna do to get powerfuls is playlist stuff, to the point where you never have to visit any of these planets anymore, you're not gonna get that experience again. And I really feel like how fun you will find Destiny 2 is completely dependent on how fun you find the Strikes, the Crucible and Gambit. Because that's gonna be the majority of your playtime. Which to me is still just a bit weird. Maybe this is just me though, because I haven't played this game that long yet. I'm fairly new to this game. I'm sure that players with thousands of hours aren't looking to go back to planets because they've already seen every single square meter of every single planet. But think about new light players right now. Players get boosted to light level 750, 
Maybe they do some story missions, some side stuff to get the light level 900, which happens within just a few days. And then the only thing that matters is for them to get powerful drops, which means go to the tower, pick up bounties, play strikes, crucible, vex offensive, gambit, and maybe a nightfall if they have friends for that. I hope you're starting to see my point now. And of course there's more to endgame than just getting to max light level or max power level. It's also about getting all those exotics and the god rolls on some of the best weapons. Um, and there are great activities in the game that allow you to farm for god roll items rather than simply go for higher light items. Uh, a good example is the menagerie. Really like the menagerie, really cool activity and, and really cool that you can target farm loot there so to speak. But at the end of the day Destiny 2 is really an FPS game above an RPG game. Meaning that the differences in stats and builds are far less important and extreme than in any other RPG game that I've ever played. Which honestly means you can kind of just wing most of it, you can kind of just do well even if you have super shitty gear. As long as you're off the right light level, you should be doing just fine. Yes I know, we just got armor 2.0 and the game has a whole bunch of stats. But it's all very controlled, it's all very held back. It's hard to explain this, but Bungie has been, in my opinion at least, very very careful with what players can buff and how much they can buff it. You know, you can get some mobility, which means you can jump a bit higher. You can get a bit more shield, uh, you can start self-healing a little bit faster, and you can decrease the cooldowns a little bit, but there's no stat that, for example, flat out buffs your damage. Uh, like in the Division, where you have a stat called Weapon Damage that you can stack to over 100%, which then means you do over 100% more damage than the average player. Uh, and that kind of stuff is required if you want to do the high-level activities. You can get crazy uh, in other RPG games, but you can't really get crazy in Destiny. Resilience, for example, is a stat that increases your shields. If you stack that all the way to the max, you have maybe... 15% more shields than if you were to not spec into it at all, which means that you can at most take one or two extra bullets uh, before you die. Uh, never can you get beefy enough to tank, for example, a few sniper bullets, uh, even if you decided to forego everything else. Uh, it's just not there. Even the perks that you get on gear increase reload speed, weapon swap speed, give you more ammo for certain guns or makes it so that you flinch less while aiming and getting shot at, or it lets you pick up more ammo. But it is never a straight up boost to damage or anything that would really matter and make your character truly far stronger than someone else's character. And this is again because I believe that Bungie wants to keep this an FPS first and an RPG second. Yes, you have builds, but you can just do fine without them. And as a result, the grind for god rolls and good gear isn't really required uh, in, the, in the slightest. All you really need is to have enough light level and a couple of meta weapons which can be obtained by just playing PvP. Uh, which at the moment happen to be Recluse and the Mountaintop. Uh, sure, there's also some stuff like Izanagi and Wendigo that are also quite important to have. And uh, you can go for a few other important exotics, but honestly that is all you will ever need. And that's also all that I had when I went into the Garden of Salvation raid with contest mode enabled. Same goes for my teammates. This is really all we had. Recluse, Mountaintop, Izanagi, Wendigo and then, you know, some random gear that's high enough light. And we ended up doing just fine. We didn't get rolled first, but we got that day one clear. Gear really isn't that important in Destiny. On top of that, Destiny 2 also really respects your time when it comes down to loot rewards. Uh, and if you decide to grind those god rolls, and that is because of two things. One, its collection system, and two, because of infusion. The collection system is something that you can access uh, from the menus, where you can see all the weapons and gear that you've ever acquired, and simply get another copy of it if you wanted to. This is very useful for, for example, exotic weapons and pinnacle weapons, which always have the same perks. It allows me to, for example, safely delete any exotic that I'm not currently using, but if it were to ever receive a buff in the future and become meta, well, I already collected it two years ago, so I can just get it again from collections. I don't have to farm for it again. It doesn't really work like that for gear, because gear, of course, comes with some random stat rolls, and stuff from collection comes with fixed stat rolls that are also a bit lower. So uh, for gear, it's not that useful, but you can see how this feature is great for something like exotic weapons. And then 
Uh, there's also infusion, which allows you to use a higher light item that you found, for example, during playing to boost a lower light item up to that same light level. Uh, usually in these type of RPG games, uh, the moment a patch comes out, all of the stuff that you previously had is useless because everything that you can now collect uh, drops at a higher item level and is just more powerful. But with Destiny, that's not the case. You can just use whatever item you find on the floor, take the power level of that item and infuse it into the gear or weapon that you already have. So if you get the God Roll for something once in your life in Destiny, you will always, always have it and will be able to bring it with you all the way to the end of the game's lifespan. The only reason why you would ever farm again in Destiny with a new update is if they added new weapons that are somehow more powerful than the stuff that you already have. Which also means that there is a forced power creep in Destiny 2 and that PvE gets easier and easier. Which is something that I've tried to combat uh, with the most recent Shadowkeep update. You know, nerfing a whole bunch of talents on gear. Which then means that uh, God Rolls are even less important to have because now the perks also don't matter as much. Now don't get me wrong, I think Infusion and the collection system are great. They are fantastic tools that makes it so that you're never wasting your time in Destiny. Once you get that item, you have the item and you will keep the item. But to get back to my point that I started talking about five minutes ago, it also means that the grind in Destiny is not that demanding. Sure, you can do some Nightfalls for a good shoddy, if you decide you want to have a good Mindbender's Ambition. Uh, and you can chase the God rules from time to time. Uh, and yeah, you need to play some PvP to get that Recluse, but once you have those weapons, it is done. Finished. You never have to do it again. And with every update, all you have to worry about is just getting Powerfuls. Which means, all you're gonna care about is the activities that give you powerful loot. And in this case, that's only activities from playlists, pretty much, which means that most players don't have to really care about anything else that's in the game. This is a little bit of an exaggeration, but I hope you get my point now. I hope so, because I've been talking about this for the past 10 minutes. Uh, so yeah, let's, let's move on, I guess, because I also wanted to talk a little bit about the PvP in this game and seeing how quite a bit of the powerful drops are from PvP. Uh, I think it's it's worth talking about for a little bit as well. So how's the PvP in this game? Well, in my opinion, it is, uh, it's not great, but it can be fun on good days. Let me explain. The way I see it, Bungie got a really gone two ways with the PvP in this game. Either go all crazy and let players do the most ridiculous things with builds and weapons and have everything work the same as in PvE and just make PvP a complete mess, but allow people to be creative with builds. Or... They could have designed a more curated, a more arena-style shooter experience that has a competitive edge to it. And what they went for is something in the middle. Yeah, we have perks that have different stats and different damage modifiers in PvP. And yeah, we have weapons that do less or more damage depending on whether you're playing PvE or PvP. Which means that players can't really get too crazy with their builds. And if they ever get too crazy, it gets nerfed or, or patched really, really fast. So you would say, you know, they're keeping the PvP under control. But at the same time, everybody also starts off with a shotgun and a sniper and a fusion rifle or a grenade launcher and gets two ammo for that every time that they die. Uh, which those kind of weapons are considered power weapons in every other arena shooter that I've ever played. Uh, and yet players get them in Destiny for free, which means that... PvP is still kind of a really big mess. I mean, just imagine Halo, for example, but then everybody has a grenade launcher, a sniper, a shotgun, or a, a real gun or something like that. That's what Destiny PvP basically is. You can see how that can get quite messy quite fast. You know, on one side we have a competitive playlist with limited lives per round and skill-based matchmaking and a rank based on your personal skill level. And then on the other hand, we have items or abilities that let you track players behind walls, that let you one-hit melee players, that let you go into third person and look around the corner without exposing yourself. You know, on one hand, you have the precision weapons uh, and you have the ability to strafe to try and avoid getting shot at. But then on the other hand, you have the bullet magnetism, which we talked about earlier, which is great for PvE, but not so great for PvP if you combine it with a mouse and keyboard. Because now, suddenly, everybody can easily land rapid headshots regardless of how good your aim is. Some of this stuff is 
quite ridiculous how big the bullet magnetism is. And with this mix, what you end up with is sort of an arena style shooter experience, but with, in my opinion, so much bullshit in the way that fair primary gunfights where, you know, the player with the highest mechanical skill wins, that stuff rarely happens as half of the time people run around with one hit kill weapons that they get ammo for on every spawn, shotguns, fusion rifles, grenade launchers, snipers, and the other half there's not really a way to challenge opponents because their gun has far more bullet magnetism at the range that you're fighting them. So one player is always going to have a massive advantage over the other. And if that's still not the case, well, a lot of playlists are also 6v6, which is too much for these kind of maps that we're playing on, which means that you're always fighting multiple players or you're fighting with multiple teammates on a single guy. There's a lot of team shooting. There's very little room to... I don't know, just get those primary gunfights to get that arena style shooter experience because there's always some bullshit in the way, in my opinion. Now, does that mean that there's no skill gap in Destiny 2? No, 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 absolutely not. I'd say that there's a fairly large skill gap in this game. Destiny 2 has some very good players, uh, some very talented players uh, that really enjoy this type of PvP and more power to them, honestly. But most of the skill in this game doesn't really come from things such as raw aim and movement. Uh, it more comes from knowing how to deal with all the bullshit coming your way or knowing how to use the bullshit yourself. A good example would be my friend Fryko. He's a very, very good PvP player. Always top fragger with a very good overall KD. Knows the game inside out, has been playing since Destiny 1. 2.1 KD, 71% win ratio, mythic rank, whatever. Go check out his stats, go have some fun with it. He and I did a 1v1 a couple months ago and I just started playing where I was allowed to use the one eye mask that I found during one of my nightfalls and where special ammo wasn't allowed. So we only used hand cannons pretty much. This is when hand cannons were still good. Um, and I actually ended up winning that game. And I feel like in an FPS game where somebody has so much experience, where somebody is obviously so much better than the other player, you know, somebody like me shouldn't even be able to get one kill versus him. The game shouldn't have stuff in the game that allows for something like that. Now this is a testament to, of course, how good the one at mask is. Uh, this is a testament to how forgiving the aim in this game is. Because if somebody like me can kill somebody like Fryko, then what is the point of trying to get really good at this game? There's so much bullshit in the PvP that allows really bad players, such as myself as well, to get a lot of kills, that it just cannot be taken seriously. The game also does not have dedicated servers, and the tick rate of the servers are also fairly low. If I had to guess, I'd say that the tick rate would be a tick rate of 10, so kill trading is very, very common. And even the occasional DDoS happens as well. So yeah, the game has PvP, guys. The PvP is actually very encouraged, almost mandatory if you want to rank up quite a bit and get a lot of powerful gear. And there are people who are very good at it, very enthusiastic about the PvP in this game. But I just don't think it's going to be something for me to do every single day. I might do it from time to time, just to have some fun with it, just to mess around, but not more than that. And that's honestly a shame, because if this game had good arena-style based PvP, I think it would be so much bigger than it already is, and it already is such a big game. I think it could blow up if it had competent PvP. But hey, what do I know? Every time I play the PvP, I just end up wishing it was more like a traditional arena shooter. Or wishing that there was at least a game mode that more resembled that. All I gotta say is try it for yourself. Try it out for yourself and see what you think. Uh, there's also one other game mode that involves some PvP, which is called Gambit. It's sort of this PvEVP game mode, uh, where you have two teams of four kill NPCs on their respective maps to collect modes, which you can then deliver to the middle of the map for points. Uh, the PvP part is that there's a teleporter that allows one person from one team to go to uh, the map of the other team and then try to kill as many players to slow them down. Uh, it sounds kind of fun in practice, but in reality the invader gets an overshield, he has a wall hack, which allows him to see players through walls, and he can usually bring a super overpowered weapon into the teleporter with him, which then makes it a slaughterhouse for the guy invading. It is just not a fun PvP experience, it is just more frustrating than anything else. Of course it feels really good to get a 4-man kill, you're like, yeah, I did something good! 
But it's never because you're the better player, it's just because you have this enormous advantage. And because of this, I don't really like this game mode all too much either. Um, one tip that I have for you, if you, uh, you want to give this game a fair try, is to get yourself an SSD. Uh, just like Anthem, the load times in this game can be pretty lengthy if you're using a hard drive. Luckily, Bungie was smart enough to allow us full access to all menus and inventory while loading. So the loading doesn't really feel that long because you can just do inventory management during the load screens. But an SSD definitely helps a lot. And yeah, that's pretty much all I have to say about Destiny 2 right now. My voice is starting to go. It's been a long time ago since I did a, a, a voiceover of this length. Uh, but yeah, I, I hope you enjoyed it. And I would like to have a an honest discussion about this, you know? Uh, you know. This is all from my opinion. I'm still a relatively new player. As I said, I've only played for four months. So what do I really know? If you think I'm wrong about something, I'm not against having a talk about it in the comment section down below. Or maybe on Twitter. Hit me up there. As always, guys, uh, I will see you all later. Or like they say in the Netherlands, see you later.